I'm going to have you first turn to 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. There's a lot of confusion today among those who name the name of Christ. Uh, Satan is using some of this confusion to keep those who are lost blind to the truth of the gospel. There are many believers who are ignorant of the whole counsel of God, especially as it relates to church truth. And much of the confusion that prevails today stems from faulty interpretation of the Word of God. Usually it stems from people just not getting into studying the Word of God, period. Uh, but uh, if they are going about it the wrong way, it can also cause con confusion as well. There are many differences over doctrine that are rooted in the methods of biblical interpretation that are used. And so it's absolutely necessary to be grounded in the basic principles of correct biblical interpretation. And over a number of weeks, that's what we are, are intending to do here. We, we, um, uh, tonight we're going to take a look at the general laws of biblical interpretation. We'll begin with it and take a look at the uh, part of the supreme rule. The supreme rule is interpret Scripture with Scripture. Um, and I want to use as a basis for this tonight, Second Peter chapter number one, and let's let's be pick up in verse number sixteen. Uh, verse twenty is what we're going to use, but let's look at verse sixteen down, just so we understand what Peter's talking about here. Peter says, "For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ." but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Remember Peter, Peter and uh, uh, the, some of the other disciples were up on the Mount of Transfiguration to see that. Uh, see that actually happen. And he says in verse 19, he says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein to ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, here's, here's the, our text for tonight, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation okay so for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost you ever heard somebody say well you know uh, I, you can believe that that's what it says but I believe it says this well the thing is is what does it really say okay it's not a matter of what you think it says it's not a matter of what I think it says it's a matter of what does it say and because what it does say is, is, is uh, the truth. And that's what we need to be con con uh, concerned with. In 1 Corinthians 2.13, Paul said, Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual is what I want you to get. We are to interpret Scripture with Scripture. Scripture is its own best interpreter. A passage of the Bible should be interpreted by comparing it with other parts of the Bible. And that's why uh, in the, the first couple of sessions, you know, I talked to, to you about some good uh, tools to have on hand to be able to study the Bible and that treasury of Scripture knowledge. That helps you compare Scripture with Scripture. It's the best source that I know of it's a source I have used in my full 50 years of, of being saved. Um, you know, it's a, just a, a long time uh, um, being a trusted resource to help you uh, find related passages to what you're studying. Now let's look at first of all what is private interpretation of Scripture. Well, a private interpretation can be one in which a scripture passage is isolated or kept private from 
and interpreted without any reference to the rest of Scripture. In other words, it's pulled out of context. They take it, uh, well, this is what it says. Well, what is the context that is saying it in? And what is the con- There's a context within the, the passages that you're reading. There's a context within the book that you're reading. And there's a context within the, the whole of Scripture. And you need to be concerned about all of that. Let's take a look at John chapter number 16. It's the next place we want to go. John's Gospel, chapter number 16. And give you an example here of what we're talking about. John 16 and verse number 23. Jesus is speaking here. And he says, And in that day ye shall ask me nothing, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever, whatsoever you shall ask uh, the Father in my name, he will give it you. Well, that's a great promise, isn't it? It's a great promise, uh, but it can sometimes be misinterpreted of what it's, what it's not saying. Interpreting this verse privately could easily lead to a name it and claim it, which that's not what it's doing. That name it and claim it teaching, whereby all Christian needs to do to receive anything he wants is just to ask for it in Jesus' name. Just to just take that, take that little uh, in Jesus' name to the end of your prayers and but what's yours? Um, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? In Jesus' name, amen. That, I, that was a stupid song back whenever I was growing up. Uh, but it shows the idiocy of what I'm talking about. When we take time to compare Scripture with Scripture, it shows that prayer is conditional. And to ask, and it also shows us what asking in Jesus' name means. So asking in Jesus' name is more than just putting in Jesus' name on the end of your prayer. I mean, I put in Jesus' name when I pray on there, but that doesn't make it in Jesus' name. Um, what, what are we talking about when we ask in Jesus' name and what, how are we to pray? Well, let's take a look at several places. Um, look at uh, 1 John chapter number 5. We are to ask according to His will. Okay, Ask according to His will. Um, 1 John 5 verse 14 and 15. It says, and if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Um, but let back up to verse number 14. I missed verse 14. Okay, and this is important. This is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything, look at this, according to His will, He heareth us. If you're asking something that's not according to His will, you know, don't expect to get what you're you're asking for. Also, James chapter number one. Look at James chapter number one. We're to ask in faith. <clears throat> I mean, this is specifically talking about uh, praying for wisdom. If you if you lack wisdom, ask of God. Uh, Look at James 1, verse number 5 and 6 here. James 1, verse 5. says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So, we're to ask in faith, when we ask in faith, it's, that's according to we're we're asking according to God's uh, according to the word of God. Um, then look at John chapter fifteen, verse number seven. John chapter fifteen, verse number seven. <clears throat> what we need to ask is one that's abiding in Christ. Jesus says here in John fifteen. In verse 7, he says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. 
I see the will of, will of God for our lives is for us to abide in Christ and for Christ's words to abide in us. And if we do that, then we'll be asking in His name. We'll be asking um, uh, according to His will. So, um, second of all, a private interpretation can be one whereby the interpreter himself establishes the meaning of a scripture according to his own definition. Private means pertaining to self, that is one's own, by implication, private or separate. And a good, a good illustration of this is found in the Gospel of John, chapter number 3, and verse number 5. John, chapter number 3, and verse number 5. <clears throat> In John 3, verse number 5, of course, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus here, and he's uh, informing Nicodemus that he needs to be born again. In fact, verse 3, let's pick up in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of folks just stop reading there, okay? But the comparison of what he's saying there, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, is given clarification in verse number 6. That which is born of the flesh, a woman's water is broken when, they're, when you're born of the flesh. What, the, what you you come through that broken water, okay? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And so, um, I, you got to be born of the water and of the spirit. Now, uh, a common private interpretation of this passage is that baptism is essential for salvation. People look at they're born of water. You got to be baptized to be saved. That's not what it's talking about. And applying the rule of comparing Scripture with Scripture, you can come to understand that that's not what it's talking about. Many other Scriptures clearly separate baptism from regeneration. Even the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 17 said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The uh, context here shows that it refers to the physical birth. John 3, 6 contrasts the watery womb with the work of God's Spirit. The symbolism of water indicates the new birth to be a work of the Spirit of God through the Word of God. Um, and a couple other passages, Ephesians 5, 26, so that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the Word. And, as, and uh, 1 Peter 1, 23, where... Um, says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God. We're born again by the Word. And the Word is what does the washing. Amen. Uh, word of, by the Word which liveth and abideth forever. Well, are there any exceptions to this rule? Well, quite frankly, no. Um, understand it, though, that there are instances where a Word occurs in only one place in the Bible. And that makes it a direct comparison impossible. But understand, too, that all the essential doctrines of the Word of God are based upon numerous Scripture references and passages. When you just uh, pull something out and you try to make a doctrine around one verse, when there are many clear verses that uh, show that that's not what it's talking about, so you have a problem. Some things mentioned in the Bible may not be fully understood, but these do not affect areas of doctrine. And some of these things will remain in the realm of speculation on this side of glory. Yes. And an example of this is, uh, does anybody understand the Urim and the Thummim? <laughs> uh, of Exodus 28, verse number 30. Look at Exodus 28. <clears throat> Exodus 28. And verse number 30. 
Well, let's back up to verse number 29. It says here, And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate, talking about the, the garments there of the, of the priest. Aaron was the priest, the high priest. And he, he, he has a breastplate of judgment upon, upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. <coughs> Excuse me. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart. And he shall go, go in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Now, all that can be determined from this reference here, and the, I've given you some other references that, that you could uh, look up uh, on your own, uh, uh, but what you can tell is that they were, it was some means by which God indicated His will, uh, the will of His will for Israel through the high priest. Now, no one can say for certain exactly what they were how they functioned, and, but listen, we don't have that today. It's not a concern for us. Jesus put that in the past for us, okay? And you know, when you have an instance like this, you have to check the context. Often the immediate context will show what's meant by a particular word. Uh, if, if the context doesn't tell you what it is, check a dictionary. If the word is one of the few archaic words in the uh, King James Version, you can refer to the Oxford English Dictionary or what I use in my um, office is the 1828 American Dictionary of the English Language by Noah Webster. And if the word is a noun, uh, a Bible dictionary may shed light on its meaning, especially as it applies uh, uh, to places and objects of Bible lands. And then uh, find the, the word uh, in the strong exalted concordance of the Bible and look up the definition in the Hebrew dictionary for the Old Testament or, or Greek dictionary for the New Testament. But one of my favorite resources, and I mentioned this also um, when we were talking about resources to have, this is about manners and customs of the Bible. But even they have difficulty with this one particular thing. Okay, um, when you when you look in here, uh, it does have the uh, breastplate, and it does talk about the urim and the thummim, which means lights and perfection. It tells you that in here. But it said, um, he says precisely what these were. No man knows. They were used as a means of consulting Jehovah in cases of doubt. And he gives some references here. How they were used cannot be now told. Some think that the twelve stones were the Urim and the Thummim, the stones themselves being the Urim or lights, and the names of the tribes engraven on them being the Thummim or the perfections, because they represented the, the tribes in the in their and their tribal integrity. From the fact that the Urim and Thummim are are said to be in the breastplate, others again think that they were separate from the twelve stones and were put into the pocket behind them. Some suppose them to have been three precious stones which were placed in this pouch of the breastplate to be used for casting lots to decide questions of doubt and uh, that one of the stones was engraven with yes and, on, and another with no and the third without any inscription. <laughs> um, the stone drawn out by the high priest would indicate the answer, affirmative, negative, or no answer to be given. And the, this may have been so, but there is no proof of it. And the, when, you, when you come like this, the best you can say is, well, we'll find out when we get to glory. Amen? <laughs> There's some things that we don't have to know. We don't have to know that. Uh, it's not something we need to know. I mean, it's, it's good to, to have good resources. And this is, this is one of the most excellent manners and customs books. If it's going to have it in there, this would have had it. I, this is from my college days at Tennessee Temple when I first got this. So, uh, very, very good resource, too. 
But um, that's, that's just an example of sometimes um, what we're talking about interpreting scripture with scripture may may not uh, may not help you a whole lot. Okay. A truth. The uh, third thing here we see a truth we can draw from other truths. Uh, the word of God is inerrant and infallible. Therefore, no passage in the Bible will ever contradict another passage. Psalm 119, verse 160 says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. John 17, 17, Jesus said, He prayed to the Heavenly Father, He says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Skeptics are always claiming the Bible is full of contradictions. You ever heard anybody tell you that? Or try to argue? Uh, well, that old book is just full of contradictions. Well, show me one. <laughs> that usually gets them because they don't know of any. They just heard it all their life. And they'll, uh, they, they, they'll repeat what they've heard. But most of them about taking time to, to try to do a serious look at the thing. Um, but it's also true that the application of this supreme rule will resolve most any difficult or problem text, interpreting Scripture with Scripture. Understand that some of the Bible is like milk, is easily digested and understood, but much of the Bible is like strong meat. It requires diligent searching and study. You know? um, if you're going to study the Bible in a shallow way, expect to have shallow knowledge. If you're going to study the Bible deeply and dig for the truth uh, in the way that Proverbs chapter number 2 says that we're to dig uh, for the wisdom of God, then that, that will help. Some, uh, some examples of apparent contradictions and difficulties I've given you there. Um, and we're going we're gonna to stop here. Um, let, me, let me encourage you to to study those on your own. I'm not going to say that we're going to come back and, and finish this. I've given you that that you can take a look at yourself and and uh, and finish that on your own. So uh, we, we need to spend some time in prayer. So let's set that aside, and we'll come back, and, um, uh, and next week we'll be taking a look at uh, another general law. But I'm gonna leave the, leave the rest of that for you to look at, at on your own, and you can um, you can you can check with me if you got any any questions about it. All right, let's uh, set that aside, pull back out our prayer list, and pray for the needs, and let's be dismissed tonight.